Hey there, welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Amanda Vinicky. Brandis Friedman and Paris Schatz are on assignment. Here's what we're looking at. Traffic disruption ahead. The city details its plans for street closures and parking restrictions in preparation for the NASCAR Chicago streetcar race. Following David Brown's departure, the search is on for Chicago's next police leader. Today marks 100 days on the job for Chicago's new FBI chief. WTTW News gets an exclusive look into his time so far. You may not have experienced what you're seeing on this stage, but it, it actually did happen. A murder mystery takes the main stage at CIBC Theater. And a women inclusive gym is taking a different approach to wellness. And now to some of today's top stories. Day six of a strike at Chicago State University with a special guest at the picket line. Chicago Mayor-elect Brandon Johnson, who says he was there to show solidarity. Workload and compensation are top issues. Faculty and staff who belong to CSU's University Professionals Union say the school hasn't budged. Reinvented, uh, reconstructed, thought all kinds of creative ways to make our institution better, to make our students better off so we can get back in the classroom to no avail. CSU's administration says this weekend it offered a proposal that would give what they call a significant percentage of the bargaining unit raises between 3 and 7 percent in the first year of a new contract. Meanwhile, there's also a strike at Eastern Illinois University, a walkout anticipated at Governor's State University tomorrow as well. More on the higher ed strikes online. Everyone's all right, despite what a fire chief described as a dangerous fire in Bridgeport. A Chicago firefighter was transported this morning from the scene in the 2900 block of South Archer for what the department described as a minor issue. Last week, two Chicago firemen died in the line of duty. The city's unveiled what traffic changes will ensue for regular motorists as NASCAR rides into downtown for its summer street race. Street closures will begin in early June, a month before the race, and continue through mid-July. And yes, that includes partial shutdowns of DuSable Lakeshore Drive. And we'll have more on those NASCAR headaches with reporter Matt Masterson right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. Preparations for the upcoming NASCAR Chicago street race are set to try the patience of downtown motorists. Today, the city of Chicago and NASCAR provided details on an array of road closures and parking restrictions ahead of the July 2nd race. WTTW News reporter Matt Masterson joins us now with details. Let's rev it on up, Matt. <laughs> How long are the preparations for this race going to take? And that is including both the setup and then there's, of course, teardown, too. Right. So race weekend's only going to be two days, but traffic's going to be affected a lot longer than that. Um, according to this plan that was unveiled today, um, parking and road availability is going to begin to be affected in early June, and it's expected to last into well into mid-July in and around Grant Park where this race is going to be held. So it's going to be parking restrictions in some areas, road closures in others, but it's going to be several weeks where there's going to be issues going on. All right, give us a greater sense of that, the, the main parking restrictions right. and road closures that are going to impact most of us. So parking restrictions are going to begin in early June along Columbus um, before there's actual more closures um, or later in the month. So Columbus Drive between Jackson and Roosevelt is going to get closed down on June 25th. Southbound DeSable Lakeshore Drive is going to get shut, shut down uh, lane closures on June 28th from Randolph to McFetridge. The next day, Roosevelt's going to be shut down on uh, and east of Columbus and north that, northbound Michigan Avenue is well. The following day on June 30th, southbound Michigan Avenue between Balboa and Jackson. And then on race weekend, uh, northbound Lakeshore Drive is going to be shut down in areas as well. Lakeshore Drive, Michigan right. Avenue, some of the big ones. Yikes. So does the city have any recommendations on, say, alternative routes that motorists can use? They did put out a list of other routes that people can take, both north-south and east-west. Some of the north-south ones include state, 
Dearborn, LaSalle, Wells, Franklin, and Upper Wacker. And going east to west, there's some streets including Randolph, Washington, Madison, Roosevelt, and 18th and 22nd streets as well. But there's obviously going to be numerous traffic issues regardless of those extra routes available. Yes, of course, as people are bypassing those major roads and going on to others, right. those will get more backed up. Right. All right, so is this going to be a one-off event or an annual right. festivity that motorists yeah. can deal with the challenges of. So Mayor Lori Lightfoot, she agreed, she announced a three-year deal with NASCAR. It's supposed to begin this year and extend into 2024 and 2025. But of course, she was defeated in the recent election. So uh, Mayor-elect Brandon Johnson, he has said that he is not a fan of this deal. He's spoken out about potentially reviewing this in the future and tr potentially trying to find ways to get out of this. So it's possible that this could be the only year they do it. Well, thank you for all of that information yeah. and um, yeah, fun for NASCAR <laughs> fans, maybe not so much for <laughs> the rest of us. You can read Matt's full story on our website. That's WTTW.com slash news. for a new Chicago police superintendent is officially on. Joining us to explain what the new process is, is Community Commission for Public Safety and Accountability President and leader of the superintendent search, Anthony Driver. Now, thanks for joining us, but first, Thank you for let's having me. lay out the basic steps the Community Commission for Public Safety and Accountability will be taking. First, start accepting applications. That started last Friday, deadlines May 7th. Second, get community input. That begins tomorrow. Third, review applications. Fourth, interview candidates. And fifth, by July 14th, send three candidates to the new mayor who gets to make the final call. Let's dive into those steps a little deeper here. And to begin with, the first of four community sessions is tomorrow night. What are you hoping to gather from these sessions that you don't already know. You've got a pulse on the public, right? Yeah, yeah, but it's nothing like actual, like raw community engagement. So we wanted to do it a little differently. Um, so we're going to every part of town. We'll have a meeting on the south side, on the north side, on the west side, and then we'll have a big virtual meeting uh, for anybody, you know, across the city who'd like to attend. Uh, we want to know what residents want to see in their next superintendent. What are some of the priorities? Um, you know, what, what, what do they care about? So we're going to do it town hall style. Uh, where residents are able to talk to us and we're able to talk back and ask each other questions and engage. Um, I've already heard that some residents have a person in mind that they want to come and pitch and you know so we're, we're open uh, to, to actually listening to residents on the front end as opposed to you know once there's already a selection that has been made. So looking for qualifications, names even, any mm -hmm. of it you'll listen to. What about the mayor-elect? Does Brandon Johnson get to give input too or maybe you've already met with him about this? Yeah so I, I, had, a, I had a chance to speak to mayor-elect Johnson uh, the day after the election and it was a, a very brief conversation um, and he's conveyed to me that he you know generally supports this process. Uh, he's not submitted names um, he, but you know in general he wants to make sure that we have a very robust community engagement process us. He wants to make sure that we have the resources that we need to Probably conduct the Texas. search. Um, so he, you know, he has, has offered his support as well as Mayor Lightfoot. Applications already open as a Friday. No, it's early, but have you received any? I mean, it's not like it's a surprise you job know, posting. I, I, met, I met with our staff today and I, if somebody submitted application over the weekend and they went out Friday, they, my guess would be that they didn't do that great of a job. Okay, so so it's not, a lengthy application then. It, it, it takes you know, it takes thought um, and it's, it's something that it's not just submitting a resume. We want to know why you think that you are a good leader um, and, and how you plan to collaborate. So it's not it's not a, a you know, a, a LinkedIn press a button application. Got it. Mm -hmm. it. When you do have the opportunity to go through the candidates and then interview them mm -hmm. and then send the final trio to the mayor, what happens if he doesn't like any of the top choices? Yeah, so in incoming Mayor Johnson has the right to deny, to reject our list. And if he rejects our list, uh, we have to go back to the drawing board. And, and you know, I don't want to say start the process all over because it, it, it's a scenario where we already have a bench sort of um, of people who are ready to go. But if, if the mayor chooses to uh, reject our list, the process starts all over. All over. So yep. once again, accepting applications, community search, the yep. whole kit and caboodle. But on the other hand, if the mayor does like one of those candidates, yep. can Mayor Johnson then 
hire him or her outright or no. okay well it so the the way that the process uh, works is that we submit the three names say the mayor chooses candidate b um then that, that candidate b comes before our commission again for a public hearing uh, after that it goes to the public safety committee of the city council um and then it goes before the full city council for a final vote so basically the mayor selects uh we do a hearing and then there's a uh, a confirmation by the city council. Lots of opportunities for vetting before a final choice. Correct. But then if all does it go according to that plan, what would the earliest be that Chicago would have a new police Well, there is no, so we have until July 14 to submit names uh, to, to the mayor, right? But that, that, that's not a deadline. We can beat that. If, if you know, we get a bunch of applications, we get, we go through a thorough vetting process, um, we can submit names earlier than that. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that it is important that, you know, whoever is going to lead the department that they've gone through a very thorough vetting process and they've been thoroughly interviewed and, and you know, things have been fact checked. So that so will not be rushing it. Really. Correct. Correct. We don't want to miss something. But why would anybody want this job when morale is low? The task is tough. This this I think those things are true, but this is also a great opportunity. I think Chicago is still the single greatest city in, in the world. I also um, you have an opportunity to lead the second largest department in this country, and you have an opportunity for a reform-minded person or someone who wants to uh, change that around. That's an opportunity to show that you have what it takes to to completely revamp uh, the way we do public safety in our city. So it, 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 there are great challenges, but it's also a great opportunity for somebody um, who, who wants to come in and, and, and be a part of, of making history. We've got about 10 seconds left. Is there anything in particular that you are looking for? Uh, somebody who puts the community first. Somebody who has buy-in from the rank and file, from the community, from the administration, and, and from our commission. Well, thank you so much for sharing that process thank with you. us. I know all of Chicago will be watching and waiting. And we are going to be back with more right after this. What does justice for Emmett Till look like for you? Justice for, in our sense, is to serve humanity. Black storytelling is a huge part of our culture, and so we wanted to make sure we gave young writers the opportunity to share their stories. I think it's important that people feel empowered and a find a light within themselves, whether it's art or not, but if it can be sparked with an idea, I think that's the type of things that change the world. Today marks 100 days on the job for Chicago's new FBI chief, Robert West Wheeler Jr. And it's already been an eventful few months involving bribery, kidnapping, carjacking cases, and of course, ongoing corruption cases the FBI has had a hand in pursuing. And here to discuss his time in Chicago so far and what's next on the agenda is FBI special agent in charge, Wes Wheeler Jr. Thanks for joining us. And you are in Chicago after stints in D.C., Dallas, even Afghanistan. Sure. So why come to Chicago? No, it's a, it's the opportunity of a lifetime. It's, uh, I'm very privileged um, to have the opportunity for the job. It's the fourth largest field office in the Bureau. Um, some of the best work in the Bureau happens here. Um, it's an iconic city, um, just a fantastic place to work. A lot of potential to be impactful in the mission and uh, that's what I'm most excited about and it's just been a been a great thing. So speaking to some of that, I know that top that crime is a top concern for residents. Of course, after the mayoral race, we've had lots of polling. We know this. How are you approaching violent crime any differently than your predecessors? Well, we have been in the violent crime business for a long time. Uh, I think it's always incumbent on us to try to do it better. How can we be more impactful? How can we help more? That's a problem that we're not going to solve all by ourselves. It's not a problem that's going to go away easy. Um, but there's a very collaborative environment with Chicago PD in particular. Um, and I want to be very thoughtful and very um, considered on how we're doing um, in violent crime, what our resources look like. And I'm interested in making sure that what we're doing is as impactful as possible. We're going to keep doing what we're doing. We, we do an awful lot of work with our task force, violent crime task forces, carjacking task forces. Uh, we're out there every day, every night, um, doing the business. Uh, but I would like to always try to be as impactful as possible. Any asks that you have of, say, the federal government or the, the city and further collaborations, technology, funding that could help that go further? Uh, so all of that's important. All of it's a part of it. Um, we, we're not lacking for resources in combating this problem. It's a priority for the Bureau 
um, has been and will continue to be. Um, the personnel, um, the agents and analysts and support staff that are dedicated to this, the resources that they bring, technology, um, financial resources, all of that is available. I think the trick is just making sure that that's used in a way that's impactful. Um, we'll take all the Going help we can get. Going after the worst of the worst, is that what that means? Well, absolutely. We, you know, the type of impact I want us to make is to attack a criminal enterprise that can remove criminals um, and the architecture of their organization that's committing violent crime or a, a criminal enterprise. We want to dismantle that. Um, and that's, that's not always um, one arrest at a time. That's a, a longer term uh, investigation that requires a lot of um, uh, resources and rigor to do that correctly. It takes time, but that's what we're doing. In Chicago, going to be getting a new mayor who has a lot of opinions on the subject of crime. Do you plan to meet with Mayor-elect Brandon Johnson? And what, from your perspective, does he need to know? Well, so I look forward to working with everybody in, in Chicago. Look forward to um, the new uh, administration. Look forward to a new uh, police superintendent. Um, look forward to continuing to do the things that we've done with Chicago Police Department uh, specifically. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of great work, um, but a lot of opportunity for more work, and we'll continue to do that. Now, another big issue in Chicago is, of course, corruption. And I watched an interview just after you had come to Chicago where you said you don't necessarily believe that corruption or crime are any worse in this city than sure. they are elsewhere. Sure. I think a lot of folks would say, really? Are, are you really? about that? Sure. Y hey, yeah, so, do you stand by that? Uh, well, hey, yes. I think that it's definitely a problem. Um, it definitely exists. It's definitely a priority for us. Um, and I think we're very capable and have been very good historically of making those cases. Um, I, I think corruption matters in Chicago, serious concern. I think it is in other cities too, but we're gonna keep doing what we're doing here. You watching that ComEd trial? Yes. Any takeaways that you can share? Uh, no, so it's hard for me to talk about a sure. pending matter like that, but sure. I'm uh, proud of our um, agents and staff that brought that case. Now, your background, however, is in counterterrorism. So is that a particular concern in Chicago? And just briefly, how does your past work inform what you're doing in Chicago in regards to that? Well, it's a concern to all of us every day. I mean, it's, sure. uh, it's our number one priority uh, for the FBI to protect Americans from a, counter from a terrorist attack. We do that every day. Uh, we'll continue to do that. Um, the, uh, the way of doing business that uh, uh, we did in, in D.C. or overseas or anywhere else, that mindset of protecting Americans and investigating those threats hard um, is what we do. We'll continue to do that. And uh, there's no, that's, that hasn't gone away. I don't expect for that threat to go away. And we'll keep doing what we're doing. Thank you so much. Yeah. And um, best wishes in all of your work here. Thank you. There's more Chicago tonight just ahead, so stick around. A murder mystery is taking center stage at the CIBC Theater in a Broadway production based on a film from the 80s. Arts correspondent Angel Ito marches us over to Norm Lewis and his rendition of A Soldier's Play. In 1984, a depiction of a black soldier's experience during World War II hit the big screen in A Soldier's Story. Right in the lobby of the officers' club. The story follows Captain Richard Davenport, a black officer sent to investigate the murder of the troop's master sergeant. Like it or not, Captain, I am all you've got. That story has since been adapted into a Broadway production titled A Soldier's Play. It stars Norm Lewis, who plays Captain Davenport. My first understanding of A Soldier's Play was the movie A Soldier's Story, and that was back in the mid-'80s. And Denzel Washington and, you know, David Allen Greer and, you know, the great Howard Rollins. I heard he got critical acclaim, and then finally, it made it to Broadway like in 2020. But after all these years, even winning a Pulitzer Prize, you know, it took that long for that to happen. How far do you think you could get? Even if you succeed, these locals aren't gonna charge a white man in this parish. There's a murder right at the beginning. And then I'm there to investigate that. 
So it's that element, but then it's also shrouded in racism. It's also shrouded in self-hatred, uh, brotherhood, uh, elements of uh, these men who want to fight for the country to be respected once they come back because they think that that will help their cause. And we know that that's not true. The entire show is through my eyes. But then I'm interviewing people to find out who did this, you know, this murder, uh, and they're telling their story. When asked how veterans who cannot relate to the experience of serving while black would respond to the play, Lewis recalled his time working on a Spike Lee joint, De Five Bloods, and its depiction of serving in Vietnam while black. And what I found out was that was the first war that there was not a separate army, not a black and a white army. It was all mixed together. <laughs> My mama told me uh -huh. that money is the root of all evil. What role do you see art playing in bridging the gap um, amongst audiences that will come to see this production? It's art that really guides us and gets reaches to the heart and soul. And if they can see something being depicted on that stage, and hopefully if we bring the real element and the authenticity of it, hopefully their hearts and minds will change or at least be inspired. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. I like that art that guides us. Now you can see a soldier's play through Sunday at the CIBC Theater. For some new members of a gym, the environment can become a daunting experience. Reporter Joanna Hernandez recently visited a gym in Waukegan that's taking a different approach to gym culture, aimed at uplifting women and reshaping fitness ideals. Here's another look. After leaving the corporate world and having her first child, Maribel Wilson took a chance and opened a gym in Waukegan. That's why it's so important to me and why I'm so passionate about it is because I pretty much gave up my old life just to have this come true. Wilson started WWM, a gym that's grown to more than 130 members to serve women of all shapes and sizes. I hope to instill hope in other women that they can also go out there and feel amazing every single day. Member Mireya Martinez says this attitude was exactly what she was looking for. I was starting my, I guess you could call it weight loss journey, where I was at a place where I was most vulnerable. I didn't have a lot of self-confidence. It wasn't like going to a regular gym where a lot of people are already really, really fit and lifting heavy and wearing crop tops. And I didn't want to be taken in by that. I didn't want to be brainwashed by the image that I needed to be like an Instagram model. No, I need to be myself. And I think that's what Maribel really, really reinforces in our brains that you have to be the best you. You don't have to be the best anybody else's. Psychology professor Jocelyn Carter leads the Healthy Families Lab at DePaul University, studying the fitness industry and its impact on women. A lot of the media, including social media, in sort of like the fitness, athletic space is largely geared towards white women and has historically been women with a particular body type. But Carter says there are ways to make exercise and fitness more inclusive by taking a more community-centered approach. We can get women into gym spaces where it's not just a uh, focus on like, you know, what the weights are and what the different equipment is, but there's some sort of sense of, of community. Maybe people are learning how to do particular things together and making, um, making a connection and having it be more of like a, a, a more of a family and, and community space. WWM is taking a community approach to fitness by creating events outside of workouts. When not being utilized as a gym, the space is used to host conversations for the community. Past events include discussions about breast cancer, sex, miscarriage, abortion, and infant loss. I feel like a lot of us have a lot more in common than we think, but sometimes it's not talked about. It's like kind of like therapy as well. <laughs> Here has been a space where a lot of us feel super comfortable with one another. I have women here who talk about all types of things. So I feel like this place has become an outlet for how we have grown up. For Martinez, the goal is no longer to lose weight. It's about much more. It's not all about the weight loss anymore. It's about meeting new people. It's about being me. It's about finding myself again. I want women to feel empowered after leaving WWM. I want them to feel that they can do anything in this 
world, anything in this life, they can make any changes. Whether it's a mental or physical workout, members say they are strengthening the bodies they have at times struggled to love. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Joanna Hernandez. Makes me want to get pumping some iron. Now, the gym is not women exclusive. Men are welcome as well. Some men have even requested a class where they can feel comfortable starting their new fitness journey. And that is our show for this Monday night. Please join us tomorrow night live at 10 on the show with the fight for abortion pills head to the Supreme Court. Plus, celebrating 10 years of Expo Chicago with a preview of artists, museums, and a new initiative, Southside Nights. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Amanda Vinicky. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and have a great night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that's proud to serve its community through pro bono legal services.